The final part of our conference is called closing session. <laughs> you can see already from the title, we did not know what would happen at the, at the very end. We didn't even give, give it a proper title. Uh, but what it is intended to do is uh, to try to draw some conclusions and look out for implications. Uh, and maybe, maybe if we find the time, talk about the future. Uh, talking about the future, as we said in the first uh, panels, needs uh, talking about uh, the history. Uh, and if I understood correctly what had been said so far, then why the Hafsir monarchy is relevant for our European Union future is its flexibility. That's what Jan Silonka very skillfully detailed and presented to us. Uh, on the other hand, I'm not so sure whether it was so flexible uh, after all. Uh, I guess there were other strategies that helped the Habsburg monarchy to survive. Uh, and unfortunately, and that's also what I take from the session so far, one of those preconditions was that uh, the, the whole notion of liberalism, which can lead to nationalism, <laughs> came only in the 19th century. Before that, in the Habsburg monarchy, that was not an issue. So that helped a lot. And one has to say, actually, uh, there were people uh, like Grillbatzer even who said, the der Weg der neueren Bildung führt von der Humanität über die Nationalität zur Bestialität. Uh, I can't translate this into English, but I guess you understand it all. Uh, and there is some truth in it when we look into political life uh, how fast in the 19th century, uh, mainly in, in the Central European context, liberal thinking uh, turned to become nationalist, national thinking. Uh, it is obviously to do with the fact uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, for all the social nece necessary reforms that were needed, uh, it was a good vessel. It promised, some, it promised something different from what an empire or the, the multinational monarchy uh, could provide. Uh, and and that's, I think that is something that we should consider nowadays. If the uh, national parts, and all of us rightfully said, this is a un union based on member states. A and whether we like it or not, whether we call it a mistake that it was founded like that, that's the situation we are in. And I know a lot of diplomats always complaining uh, about the, 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 the way of uh, intergovernmental uh, ruling which comes more and more to the foreground, but this is a fact. Uh, and if we, if we say it is, then it's maybe worth looking what happened in the 19th century uh, in, the, in, the, in the sort of pre nation of, of national ideas and how they took over uh, from, from the Habsburg Empire but also in other, in other instances uh, in, in, in Europe. One could even talk about the Ottoman Empire and, and how the end of the Ottoman Empire uh, may, be, may give some interesting, tell you some interesting stories of, of which sort of policies can take over uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, these sort of, of uh, multinational uh, polities. In the Ottoman Empire, a lot of historians now tend to say there were so many liberal attitudes uh, regarding minorities uh, and regarding how they, they had to rule, had to rule uh, this, this polity, uh, that possibly there is some, there are some similarities. So I guess this is where we are. We don't really know, but we didn't expect that we would know at this point, uh, whether it's the flexibility of the Habsburg Empire or whether it, it, it was uh, the uh, inadequate capability of transforming uh, to uh, new national demands in the late 19th century. Uh, anyhow, both of these theories that, that were presented so far uh, tell us that it is relevant for what's going on now because we seem to have a very similar problem uh, about the challenge of not being flexible enough and if the, Euro the European Union is flexible it is immediately, in, I would almost, almost say insulted by the political scientists 
uh, who say, well, Schengen, uh, you say the first time Schengen is needed, it doesn't work, uh, or uh, we have these sort of financial regulations, which not even the Germans, the French, and now the Italians want to accept. Uh, and uh, so there are these, uh, these uh, uh, insults or these complaints about this, uh, and we have to live with this. Weber, and this is now for the panelists, I think, to discuss, whether this is a good omen uh, for the future of the European Union and whether it means that we can muddle through, muddling through, as most of pre us present here know, is a very Austrian strategy that we learned from the, the 19th century mainly. There are quite a lot of, of Austrian politicians, late 19th century, uh, tended to use this uh, and live with compromises, again, something which comes from the tradition of the Habsburg monarchy, that we always feel that compromises are the most stable thing that you can create in the world anyhow. Uh, whether this is true or, or whether we need this sort of basic change, that again Jan Silonka proposed, uh, that as long as the, the dominant loyalty goes to nation states in, in the European Union, there is no salvation. We can only hope that, that nothing happens and this, this time a term of war is not really coming back and we can only hope that the empires around the European Union do not realize how weak uh, this polity is uh, or hope that it's not true that Mr. Putin two years ago promised that he will create new medium-sized uh, nuclear weapons uh, which uh, can be used uh, on the closer range uh, and when you think about it, the closer range can only mean the European theater. Uh, we can only hope that this is not true and we, 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 we can survive the way we are. I am not so sure that's true uh, and we, uh, I guess we should discuss now uh, what this has to do with history and why it is uh, so important. Uh, my own ideas, I, prom I presented at the morning so I will stop here, I will only uh, act as a, uh, as a chairman even if it's not mentioned in the program, uh, but maybe uh, one question I would like to, 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 to raise here also. Uh, the question is, why actually in global politics we are all interested in history? Why? Is it really? Is it really because only the European Union has its fundamental problems? Why, are, why is this interesting in, in global politics? Uh, I think it has, uh, has a lot to do with these sort of glo global theories which appeared immediately after the end of uh, the breakdown of the communist, this idea of Mr. Fukuyama that it's the end of history actually created uh, this geopolitical interest in history because it was not only the liberal democracy that was there, had no enemies and could thrive, but actually there was a new need for, for ideologies, maybe a return to old ideologies or trying to create new ones. Um, if you look at the big empires, most of them returned, or and this was mentioned today as well. Uh, the Russian uh, are using 19th century ideas now to to recreate uh, empire. So maybe it was really this, this these years 1989, 92, which uh, brought back to to geopolitics. Uh, yeah, by speaking that it's the end of history, uh, this uh, uh, rich interest in history. Uh, and secondly, it's, it's certainly, and this is something I think uh, we all should be concerned, it's that there's a challenge to multilateralism. There is an obvious challenge uh, because uh, of uh, the fragmented uh, global uh, order. Uh, and this um, challenge of multilateralism, there I see uh, the the, the uh, the history of 1918 uh, and the, maybe the lessons of 1918 and uh, I, I mentioned in the morning only uh, very briefly and we did, we did not discuss this, the, the notion of who did the peace treaties after, after 1918, what way they were done, uh, what, how did the countries react to this. Uh, what did it entail? Uh, why was it not more discussed actually uh, after the Second World War? It had a lot of influence on the on the peace regulations, after, mm -hmm. but but it was not really discussed afterwards. What what this sort of of, of uh, things mean? Uh, it was only, as far as I know, only really re-discussed re uh, at the end of the Balkan Wars. Uh, the people who had the, the Dayton Peace Agreements, and, and the best of the Bishevich was one of them involved in that, uh, they discussed uh, the, some of the failures also of, of the 
uh, of the peace treaties after 1918, uh, 1919. But maybe we should uh, also talk about this, what would happen there, and also the, the way the multilateral organization, the League of Nations, was from the very mo first day crippled. Uh, the most important partner did not even take part, the Americans. Uh, a lot of, of countries soon left. Uh, so what, what sort of international organization was this really? And, and it, well, I guess we all know what we might learn uh, from this. Uh, and uh, with all this, the answers uh, to the, the basic changes of 1989-1992 was what we nowadays call a return of identity politics. And it's interesting that the, uh, now the, the big idea that even Mr. Fukuyama in his latest book talks only about the return of identity politics uh, in a very specific way, uh, tells us that obviously there is a reform need, but no, no real answers from us. And, and that's one of the basic reasons why there is this strong interest, as I see it, uh, in talking about uh, the past. And maybe the biggest challenge of all is, is something which I read now every other month. Every other month in the United States or in Europe, books about the end of liberal democracy appear. And I read all of them, not that I learn much new about them. <laughs> uh, 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 some of them are funny, uh, uh, but what they tell us is, uh, and that's obvious, I, I'll stop here, that's obvious. Uh, the, the notion that we live in a progressive world, and there's a progressive world view, is challenged, is questions. Uh, we don't know what might be uh, the, the, the answer to this, but obviously not everybody uh, any longer believes that liberal democracy and progressive development of society uh, is without alternatives. I stop here and pass now on and present also the speakers. Um, we start with... Uh, sorry, sorry. We start uh, with uh, Professor Ruth Wodak, Ruth Wodak is, um, um, I think I, I may say this, she is uh, a distinguished professor, not only because she is an emeritus distinguished professor, distinguished professor for discourse studies. She was professor uh, he, as well in the University of Vienna and for a long time at the University of Lancaster in the United Kingdom. Uh, she was also a member of the... Uh, is still a member of the Academy of Sciences in Austria? No. Uh, no, she was a member. She was a member of the Academy of Sciences. From the British Academy of Social Sciences. And, and British Academy now. Uh, she was born in London, actually, because she is a, a, a child of an Austrian diplomatic family with a, a famous Austrian diplomat uh, uh, who, who was uh, representing Austria it after the second. Yeah, who had to emigrate and presented afterwards Austria uh, in, right. in Britain, but also in, in, in other parts of, uh, of the world. Uh, and Ruth Wodak is uh, famous for applying linguistics to political discourse. Uh, this plays a role, played a role in these hundred years. Uh, uh, and she is, is, is mainly looking also at, uh, on uh, authoritarian regimes and how they are using language. Uh, but Today we ask her to tell us a little bit about how she felt about the discussion of historians and political scientists coming a little bit from the outside to these sort of discussions. Please. Well, thank you. It's a big honor to be here as a non-historian and non-political scientist, although obviously my work touches on both. And maybe first to just answer your question now, why is history so important? Um, I grew up in a family, not only a diplomat, uh, but I grew up in a family where history was on the table every day, morning, lunch, and dinner. And that was the case because both parents were very interested, but had also biographies where uh, the past and the present were involved and intricately sort of mixed. And uh, in that way, I've never even had a moment, I think, in my life where I didn't think that history is important. It's always important. 
And every, and in my own work, it's obvious that every text always is in context. And as I analyzed uh, meanings, uh, be they images, be they written language, be they spoken language, be they program speeches, uh, slogans, posters, whatever, media, newspapers, television, and so forth, uh, social media, it is obvious that you cannot understand meanings without taking them into context, which is something what Wittgenstein said long ago. And in that way, history always plays into it because everything is intertextual. And uh, we always refer to something in the past and we refer to something simultaneously in the present and we re might refer to something in the future. So in that way, History is part and parcel of our research. Um, now, listening to those lessons from history, uh, I was actually really, really fascinated by the different narratives which are constructed. Now, we all know that there are certain historical facts, things happened, and it's obvious, yeah, and there was this, these peace treaties, and they're documented, and there was, so uh, wars and victories and whatever, uh, defeats. But the way this is narrated uh, for future generations, and that can be in school books, that can be individual memories, that can be collective memories, that can be family memories, and the way and political narratives can be very different. And we all know that identity constructions, and you mentioned that as well, are founded on certain <coughs> mythical narratives which are very important for each nation state, uh, which are sort of hegemonic. And I was really fascinated by the different kinds of contesting narratives which were out on the table uh, during this day on uh, sort of the Habsburg monarchy, but also on the EU, and also on the time in between. Uh, and uh, so one of them, for example, was the, the narrative of why uh, the Habsburg monarchy failed, or what happened, why did it end? Yeah? And so we have different explanations and different narratives, and one of the narratives is more economic, yeah, so there was no more food uh, and hunger, and uh, so in that way, no more money, everything. The other one was more about nationalism and ideological, so we didn't talk about ideologies, ideologies a lot today, but I think that is important. There were very distinct ideologies around at that time. Uh, and uh, another was sort of, uh, well, all these nationalism conflicts and so forth. Yeah? And then there were, of course, more. And the question, was it actually good or bad that it failed? Also different answers. And so uh, I thought that was extraordinarily interesting. And one narrative which uh, I didn't hear so much was the success story actually after 1918, because not everything was just terrible. There were lots of social reforms. There was the women's vote for the first time, uh, which we're celebrating. And there was actually no talk about gender anyway, or very little in gender politics. But the women's vote was an, a huge achievement. Um, there was the specters in the room, yeah, the communism and Trotskyism and uh, uh, other isms. Um, and uh, there was um, social housing in Vienna, there was a new health service, uh, sort of a huge sort of leap forwards uh, in social policy which hadn't existed in the monarchy, although you rightly said there was something people were cared for, but it was, of course, an authoritarian, it was a monarchy. Uh, and so suddenly people had uh, the possibility to vote and, you know, the ideology started playing a huge role. 
So the one thing which is always another narrative which has been broadcast a lot in the last days, and I watched quite a lot of television and listened to quite a lot of radio in the last days because it was all over the place with a zillion interviews, with narratives of 100 year, they found 600 year old people uh, and made a fantastic documentary which was broadcast on Sunday evening. Uh, yeah, so quite exceptional people who were telling their stories of those 100 years. And uh, one, it, one narrative which I also didn't hear was the narrative of migration, displacement, which of course happened 1918 and happened again 1945 and is happening now. Uh, so um, I find it interesting how certain stories are constructed and there's something which I call post, post hoc coherence. So although there's so much fragmentation and so much different determinants, people and nation states are very determined to find a coherent narrative, and it's teleological, yeah? It's either a success story or it's a story of failures, and then you have uh, precise explanations. It's all causal, this led to this. Well, who knows, yeah? And uh, so for us, it's always interesting also to look at the different agents, uh, who's blamed for what, and of course, one of the most uh, frequent narratives are narratives of victimhood. So basically, if you look after 1918, but the same, of course, after 1945, everybody was a victim. It didn't matter who started the war, what kind of war was it, who, who was to blame for what. We have these societies of victims. And I think that is something which is extraordinarily difficult to cope with, if, we, if I may now just say a few words about the EU. Also in the narratives accompanying the EU, I've done a lot of research on the construction of European identities as well. Um, so one thing which I find most important is the multilingualism in the EU as a symbol <laughs> of diversity. And that was something which the Habsburg monarchy also had, although it had German as an official language, uh, or not even. No. Uh, so you had it in it all the, Dutch. yeah. So it was, that multilingualism is one of the characteristics of the, Euro of the European <laughs> Union. Uh, and what we, what, what we see now, what we see now very strongly is a very different language policy which symbolizes a very different European Union. We see language as a gatekeeper. And uh, I'm, as a linguist and sociolinguist, I find this actually very frightening and um, at least, uh, yeah, frightening and, and not surprising, but frightening. There's only one EU country where there's not a language test if you want to enter and work, and that is Sweden, up to now, but they might get a language test as well. As you might know, in Austria, you even have to make the language test before you even migrate to Austria, and even that, knowing the language, might not be sufficient to be allowed to migrate to Austria. I'm not talking about refugees, I'm talking about migrants. So um, language has become a gatekeeper and we should learn, and that's one of the lessons from history, that multilingualism and diversity actually constitute or co-constitute open societies yeah? and, and open-minded societies. Forcing people to speak one language, even now a policy proposal in Austria was to ask for German even in the schoolyards, uh, which was then again retracted, uh, forbidding children to speak their native language is one of the first steps to authoritarian regimes. And we, ha we know that from, as you said, I've studied also um, authoritarian regimes. And I just want to mention another important characteristic for sort of what could the lessons be? Not only that the treaties were terrible, yeah, and, and uh, much to be discussed, 
but also the not pos no possibility of participation on local and regional levels. And I think this is something which is really um, a big problem for the European Union. And I know only of one model where it has up to now really been successful, and that's the Irish model, uh, which I don't know how many people know about this possibility that by um, vote, or not by vote, by lotto, yeah, a uh, hundred people were selected in Ireland of all professions, of gender, uh, age, uh, whatever, rich, poor, different political affiliations and so forth, selected by chance, were able to discuss for an entire year on a very sensitive topic, same-sex marriage in Ireland, very sensitive topic, that led to a policy paper which was discussed in the parliament and was part and parcel then of uh, decision making and the referendum. So a referendum very different from the British Brexit referendum, uh, sort of yes or no, and many people had absolutely no clue what they were talking about, but a very well prepared partic participatory referendum. So I would like to stop here now and just say communication is very important on all these levels, on participation, on multilingualism, and also for reflection of how we actually reconstruct the past and what that means for the present and future. Thank you, Professor Wodak, uh, for talking, uh, speaking out against language as a gatekeeper uh, into identities, which is a hot Austrian topic, uh, not only Austrian. Uh, we come now to uh, Ambassador Hidayet Piszczewicz uh, and would like to present uh, his biography. Uh, he is a most seasoned Croatian diplomat. Uh, he was... Uh, uh, ambassador to countries such as Russia, uh, but also to Turkey, to Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan also. He worked as a deputy foreign minister, assistant foreign minister. He worked as state secretary uh, for Croatia uh, in the uh, 2000s. Uh, and uh, he uh, had leading, leading positions also in the, in the, in the foreign ministry uh, in Zagreb. Uh, and before that, he was a journalist, editor-in-chief of Vjesnik. Uh, and uh, that is important also from an Austrian perspective and also European perspective. He was Secretary General of the Regional Cooperation Council, Council for Southeast Europe. We have two experts on Southeastern Europe, uh, not by chance on our, on our panel for this. Uh, and he was involved in the conferences on the Bosnia and Herzegovina peace accords in the um, mid 1990s. Uh, and finally, he did something which uh, maybe you remember what was said about the role of empires by our political scientists. He said one of the roles of empires is sort of civilizing the, 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 the periphery, and the periphery likes to do that. And maybe this is an, an example of what the European Union is doing around. Uh, the, 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 the borders. Uh, he was head of the EU delegation in Tajikistan. Um, uh, and so he, is, uh, he was, had also some experience with, with sort of this moral perspective uh, of the empire called European Union uh, in trying to bring good governance uh, and rule of law and all these sort of things to the rest of the world. Uh, well, I give the floor to you. There are so many things you might want to add. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words and thank you for the opportunity and honor to be back at this honorable academy where I, over the years and over all these posts that I was taking, uh, participated in, in, the, in the work of the Academy on many occasions. But today, very shortly, uh, by way of introduction, I feel that I might be some sort of inappropriate guest here. Uh, first, because I was born in Sarajevo. I wasn't there at the time when the mess started. 
but I know that the mess still goes on. I wasn't there, of course, when the mess started. Sorry for the word. But I know for sure that the mess goes on. Mm -hmm. And this is, from my personal perspective, the link between the beginning of the, these 100 years. And then in the 90s, early 90s, fascinated like everybody else in the world, of course, with the end of history, Fukuyama, and we will all live in a free, common, democratic, unified world from Valladolid to Vladivostok and Vancouver, I started to write a book and the title for the Italian publisher, and the title was The Last War in Europe, which was about the aggression on my own country. Because we were then hoping that, okay, we will endure the war, and then we will join this new, common, free, democratic world order. I don't have to tell you the consequences. I never finished the book because the number of wars <laughs> were <laughs> running faster than my writing. <laughs> then I went to join Croatian diplomacy in one of these capacities, and honestly speaking, was the, in a position to be one of the driving forces of Croatian negotiations with the, with the, with the EU, and much to the, with the help of the Austrian diplomacy also, because at that time we were thinking, okay, we will join the EU, we will, this will be another panacea for us, we will be a prosperous member of the European family, and this will be a new paradise, and this will be our contribution to the new world order, common, free, and democratic. And the realities are a little bit different today, both in Croatia and both in the European Union. Then I stepped into Erhard's shoes in Sarajevo, taking over the position of Secretary General of the Regional Cooperation Council, with the task to try to re-engage the countries of the Balkans in the post-war cooperation and EU enlargement, linking the two. You know the realities and you know the situation in the southeastern Europe today. The region has not joined the EU completely and the region is still out of something which actually does not exist, a new world order. And then I went to work for the OSC in Ukraine at the time of Crimea and Donbass developments. And I was at the heart of probably the harshest blow to the security and rule-based order established in the European Union after the Second World War. And then, as you mentioned, I went to Tajikistan and from the perspective of our debate today, to follow whether Central Asia, or Tajikistan in itself, with its 100,000, uh, 1,500 1, kilometers border with Afghanistan, and with all the events in the Middle East and Syria and so forth, might become another victimized region of the competitive world order that we have 25 years after the euphoria of the over the potential cooperative world order in the uh, beginning of, of the 90s. And this is the scope, at least from the personal point of view, this is the path that we went through over the 25 years. Now, going back to the to basic topic of our debate, discussion today, what happened 100 years ago? There was also a collapse of the then world order, complete collapse. In a very short period of time, marked with a huge tragedy, of course, but in a rather short period of time, a new uh, order was established. It was the first time in the history of Europe that they started to talk about democratic collective security. Unfortunately, it was based on the fundamentals that were short-lived and futile and we ended in the Second World War. After the Second World War, 
the so-called bipolar security order was established for another half of a century. And then with the fall of the wall, another stage, another phase in the development of the European security order after the collapse of the monarchy. So initial hopes and expectations spiraled into today's situation, which is to be very open, chaos and disorder. Today, in my firm opinion, we live in a world that I personally call multiple competitive international disorder. No alliances last for a week. You don't know who's against whom. Today, by way of illustration, Russia, Iran and Turkey cooperate over Syria or somewhere, but if you put these two players in Bosnia and Herzegovina, disaster. Disorder. Multiple competitive international disorder. Now going back to the to try to detect the elements of the political, social, geopolitical situation at the time of the uh, 100 years ago, one can detect telegraphically several main uh, elements. And I will try to telegraphically go through them and invite you to think about the parallelism with today's world. For example, 100 years ago, weaknesses of multinational structures. Think of the 90s. Uh, institutional in inabilities to react to the new realities or changing realities, 100 years ago. Think what happens, what happened 20 years ago and what still happens in today. Think about, for example, for about the institutional ability of international organizations today, compared with what you just mentioned, League of Nations. Uh, growing, brewing tendency for or wish for independence at that time of a number of nations across the Europe, in particular Central and Southeastern Europe, and compare it to, to the 90s and what is the fate of these, all these nations today. Another feature would be, for example, if you compare the situation 100 years ago, escalation of uncontrollable crisis. The war started and nobody, I'm quite sure, knew where it would lead. It took, I think, a couple of weeks, three weeks, after Sarajevo, that we ended in the biggest tra tragedy of the history of that time, until that time. It started on the Balkans also. Think about the Balkans today. And think about the undercurrent geopolitical tendencies uh, 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 over the Balkans. Un unpredictability looks to me another feature. Uh, not to mention, well, just for the sake of discussion, with the end of uh, the war, that was the end of then Europe as a global power. And compare it with today's position of Europe in the global theater. Uh, Technological and scientific advice, uh, advancement of that time also was a great input into the, into the uh, uh, developments related to the, to the Great War. And compare what technological, scientific and globalization is bringing today's, to the today's world, world order and world situation. <clears throat> so the question is, are we closing to end of 30s, or are we, do we still have the ability to talk about the future, as Emil suggested, and try to see the way out of this recycling pattern of uh, uh, uncertainty, unpredictability, and disorder. 
uh, we have, and this is one minute or two to conclude, we have one disadvantage over the leaders and people at the end of the First War. And these disadvantages are complete ideological vacuum. There are no tools to shape the future. Hundred years ago, there were different ideological tools. You could choose this or that way. Revolutionary, Bolshevik, capitalism, this and that. We live in the ideological vacuum time. Another issue or another feature, at that time, <clears throat> people were defining, nations were defining their identity. Now, both individuals and nations, they have identity crisis. Either through search of their own history to find the new base ground, or either fighting between, within the nations over the different identities, with political polarizations and so forth. Unfortunately, I learned a lot when I was in Ukraine about the history of that identity, identity uh, search. Another feature is, as opposed to 100 years ago, we live in the cultural vacuum also. We don't produce new cultural values at this point in time. President Trump's, Trump comes to Paris and it's about his umbrella or Melanie's shoes. Hmm. It's about Croatian president, what kind of dress she was wearing. It's not Wilsonian approach to to the, to the issues at, at, uh, at stake. And last but not least, I'm fearful to say even that, and that is we live intellectual confusion or disengagement. And this is worrisome because obviously we are, as Russian would say, we are at tupic, dead end. We need to find a way out of this situation and there are no ideas, no intellectual engagement, and so forth. So how do, how can we see the future? There are several options. Not, not very optimistic. Continuation of this contra, confrontational mode, our pattern of relations between the biggest, biggest players, without knowing the final scenario. Whether confrontation in this country, in this region, will be, uh, expand into another area of the world, God knows. Uh, we might think about even about the escalation of this current, current relations, and that's related to the question of 38. Uh, we might think about possible solution in what I was convinced was the name game behind the Russia's uh, policy over the last 10 years is an invitation to geopolitical trade-offs. Put your foot across the world and then sit down with the main players. Again, repetition of the patterns 100 years ago and defined allocations of the countries. Because the background, I've learned it serving in Moscow for six years, the background of the Russian policy, based also on something that remember, resembles the uh, um, 100 years ago, and that is the policy of revanchism. But the base ground is definition of the interest zone and spheres of interest. This is how the Russian political mind functions. We were talking about the values, we were talking about the dialogue. It ended up in the divisions and polarization and the reintroduction of the policy of force. But we will have to wait and see whether even that shameful solution of geopolitical trade-off might be at the table. And the last, uh, and of course the most wishful one, would be global engagement in the renewal of the rule-based international cooperative system, rules and principles, and not what we have today, deals. We have 
deals with North Korea, we have deal with Iran, we have, we have deals, we have trades, instead of common rule and principle-based democratic international security system. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador Biscevic. Uh, we come now to Gregor Woschnack, uh, also a uh, diplomat, but this time an Austrian yeah. diplomat. So uh, both, both more or less from the Habsburg territory. Uh, Gregor Woschnack has a long and distinguished career in Austrian Foreign Service. He was ambassador uh, in Nairobi. He was also an ambassador in Cairo. He was responsible for negotiations for Austria to join uh, the European Union, already the, the, the European Economic Zone before that. Uh, and for a very long time, he was our permanent representative if in, at the European Union in Brussels. And he's a convinced European, uh, and he asked me, uh, explicitly that this panel has to talk about the future and what we can do and what's possible. So, Gregor, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Emil. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, I'm a diplomat and I don't look like most of the previous speakers sometimes with quite a lot of pessimism into the past. And I look into the future and you will see I'm much more optimistic than most of my previous speakers. Now. Uh, if you look back to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, there was Joseph II, he made a nice uh, beau mot. He said, Austria is absolutismus gemilde durch schlamperei, means absolutism made bearable through flexibility. So basically, this is not bad. You could use the same words actually for the European <laughs> Union. Now, in starting, I want to recall what a friend of mine, Chris Patton, you know him as governor of Hong Kong and then he was a good commissioner, he told me a beautiful story of London. And in London, the Daily Newspaper Times has each year a competition among its own journalists for the best headline. And those who make the best headline, uh, they are invited for a dinner for two in one of the most expensive uh, restaurants in London. And then he told me, a young uh, journalist just coming over from uh, Oxford uh, made the first prize, and his headline was The Austrian heir uh, to the throne, Franz Ferdinand, was found alive. First World War was a mistake. <laughs> now, um, this is interesting because uh, not. <laughs> Woo, yeah, not so bad, because, you know, when the uh, Austria-Hungarian uh, Empire went to the First World War, they had actually not a real purpose what they wanted to achieve with this war, besides having a police action, you know, uh, to find those who uh, wanted to uh, assassinate uh, Franz Ferdinand. So, again, you see, they, they, they muddled through and they came into it, and it was not very well prepared. So it was, a, I think the sleepwalker uh, story is quite a good one for uh, Austria-Hungarian Empire. Now, uh, you have an Austrian poet, uh, Ingeborg Bachmann, she also said, a Geschichte lehrt, aber niemand hört it zu, meaning the history teaches that nobody learns from history. Now, basically, it, in most cases, it is true, but not in every case. So the, I want to take the two uh, things which you introduced, the first, the Treaty of Versailles, and second, the League of Nations. Now, the Treaty of Versailles, you know, we had uh, Keynes was there as the representative of the, of the Treasury, and he left, he disgusted and wrote a very good book huh, about the consequence of peace. Now, uh, he said the reparations on Germany were much too high, and he wanted only to have 40 uh, billion uh, gold mark, and actually it was uh, demanded 120 billion. Now, the 40 billion were only paid up to the taking power by Hitler, and then Hitler stopped all the reparations. But nevertheless, you know, this reparation had to be paid by debts, and it came to high inflation, which helped the Nazis very much. So again, um, history, we learn from history. After the Second World War, no reparations were demanded from Germany. Uh, so you learn out, and just in the contrary, there was a Marshall Plan to help Germany. Uh, which was, I, I think, and, and Austria, and all of the, and not only, but it was OECEC, uh, in Austria and all the European states. Well, I think it was a very generous attitude, uh, the Marshall Plan. And this also helped to start the European integration. Uh, coal and steel community, you know, you take out coal and steel 
out of the national sovereignty, what Macron, uh, Macron would call a European sovereignty, and you have a joint administration. So basically, this was to make sure that nobody can rearm in such a way, neither France or Germany, that the others don't see it, don't understand it. So basically, and then it went to the European Defense Initiative, which was a big failure, one bridge too far, and then it went, uh, the idea was good, they said, we, we start again, uh, Rome Treaty, with the same thing like European Defense Initiative, we do it with the uh, economic community and Euro too. Now, then if you jump uh, 30 years on, uh, you suddenly have the implosion of the, so of the Soviet Union. And foreseen, we didn't expect it, and uh, then the German reunification. Also not really foreseen by all the secret services all around. Now, uh, Germany was very lucky because at this time it had a uh, chancellor who studied history. And he knew, okay, we, we must make um, not a, a German Europe, but a kind of a European Germany, meaning give up uh, the Deutsche Mark uh, uh, for the Euro. And so I think uh, in this time, we started all the time to negotiate for membership. And then the commission was actually very clever. They had to make an avis about Austria. And then they said, well, you know, if Austria would join uh, the European Union, then we could take the experience of Austria uh, in, the, in the Eastern European as a useful for the future. Now, uh, when we negotiated, we never saw that nine years after we joined, we would have this big enlargement 2004. Nobody saw so. Now, basically, uh, it happened. Uh, and it, it was unexpected to us. It was, uh, you know, uh, it was Günther Verheugen who was then the commissioner for enlargement. And we had secret dinners. No, nobody was permitted to take a note. And basically, he said, we do, must do something for these uh, Central Eastern European countries, should we help them, integrate them? Otherwise, some of them will turn back in communists. Otherwise, like Poland, they will turn huh, in, in the mid between the two wars, uh, kind of right radicals. We do something. So, okay, we started to call around everybody who was working with the Marshall Plan, please help us. How did you do it? Where are the experts? No, the experts have either died or retired, so we couldn't find experts. So we had to do it ourselves from Brussels. And for Hagen had always a nice saying, you know, we all know how to make out of a fish pond a beautiful bouillabaisse, but we don't know how to make of a bouillabaisse again a living fish pond. So this was the big problem, actually, in a nutshell, which we faced, uh, that we had actually to change from the communist um, economy, uh, command economy, to a, to a market economy. This was actually, basically, now if you look, uh, we actually had to pay three times the amount of the Marshall Plan uh, to integrate the Eastern European uh, into the EU, three times the whole amount. It was quite a lot of money which went over, but it was accepted. And there's another thing, if you look to now to United States, to NAFTA, uh, Mexico has 100 million inhabitants. Basically, this is what included all uh, those new member states. Uh, but the Americans have not been able to have an internal market with Mexico. You know, the lorries of Mexico cannot go to the United States. So actually, we were much faster, and we did everything without bloodshed. I think this is a fantastic achievement, and I'm still proud of it. Uh, perhaps it was luck, I don't know. But it shows that here, you can do a lot uh, with imagination, you need money definitely, and, and dedication. And this is what actually uh, was before exercised a kind of a new colonialism, which also the Austro-Hungarian Empire had when it uh, annexed and then uh, first occupied the next Bosnia-Herzegovina. And then the Austrians had to pay uh, to Istanbul, something perhaps the Russian could learn with the Crimea, they had to pay something. Huh? So again, you see um, here there was a more civilized way to dealing with uh, the neighbors. Now the second thing is you mentioned the League of Nations. Again, something where we learned out of history. Why? Because, well, you know, uh, uh, Wilson proposed uh, the League of Nations and it was then established uh, in Geneva. But the United States Senate never ratified it because he said it was not consulted. And the, the problem was, uh, after the Second World War, the new organization, the United Nations, were not put in, into Geneva, but 
into the United States, in New York, to make sure that the Americans also ratify uh, the UN. Now, this is, this is a guarantee for all the future that uh, Trump will never leave the UN. Well, probably not, but we have also an example the goal uh, when he kicked out NATO out of Paris. We had all this example, and then the NATO went to Brussels in a just new finished uh, hospital, uh, which was not fit for NATO, but actually now they build a new one. Again, you see, uh, we learn out of history, League of Nations, Treaty of Versailles, we don't commit same stupid things again and again. So don't be so pessimistic. The next thing is, um, I think, there was a lot of criticism of the European Union, but I think you, should, you overlook the fact that the European Union is quite resilient. Uh, I think sometimes in difficult uh, periods more um, than the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It is why, well, actually we have today what you call Archicuminotea, 80,000 80, pages, in Austrian legislation has 228,000 pages, but this Archicuminotea functions actually and is respected. For example, if you look to Austria, we have uh, we had a governor of Carinthia, Haider. Uh, there were 18 judgments by the highest court in Austria uh, on the question of Slovenian language. He just disregarded it. And the Austrian government did nothing. Well, uh, if you look on the European side, the European court, uh, the judgments are respected. Once we had to, uh, European court had to go three times against Italy, on the third time they did it. So meaning that the European court, having no policeman, no soldier, the judgments are more respected than on the Austrian level. So this is, shows you interesting. Why is this so? Well, if, if you don't, uh, this is a breaking point of the whole European integration. If you don't implement judgments of the European court, uh, then the whole thing could, could blow apart. Uh, basically, this is quite interesting. In all the 60 years, the European court is very solid, very st stable, and it is also, I think, respected. Now, if you look in the other institutions, uh, for example, why you have always uh, people from Luxembourg who have now been three times president of the commission. They have asked me in Vienna, what does it mean? Do the Luxembourg people think that it is hereditary in Luxembourg? No, no, <laughs> nothing like this. But the reason is Luxembourg is the uh, smallest member state, but they are very pro-European and they speak all the languages, French, German, and English. They can go to Brescon. So it was Gaston Turner, uh, Jean-Claude Juncker now, and uh, Santerre. So we had three presidents of the, of the, from the smallest state. So again, it shows, and you must have what you call flat bureaucracies, react fast. The reason in Brussels is it's not a big one who eat a small one, it's the fast one who eat a slow one. So if you have good ideas, you can move much faster. So this is the, the Brussels, uh, the, the, the efficiency of the machinery. Now, uh, what, what is in the future? Well, you, that was a good question you put. Basically, we will have some shocks with Brexit. We will have an intellectual shock because uh, among the 10 best universities of the world, uh, there are two in the European Union. The one is called Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, from March next year, they are not anymore uh, within the European Union. This is a serious disaster. And there is among the 20 best universities of the world, there's still one uh, in Europe, uh, but it is the Eidgenos Technische Hochschule in Zurich, not members of the European Union. So this means we must do much more to have the higher level education, uh, Ivy League on the European Union, and we uh, have now proposed that we do something like European Institute of Technology, like the MIT. But you know, the MIT has just uh, two weeks ago decided to make a new institute uh, for artificial intelligence with one billion US dollar. This is the only way how we can compete in the world with Asia and the United States. We must go similar and really have also the financial power for the education. Uh, this is the money which we definitely need. And we have also the question, uh, custom union, it, well, basically it works, internal market. 
and right. defense. Europe. Now, everybody has been shocked because Macron said we should have a European army. I'm not at all shocked. It was already tried out. It didn't work. Uh, the goal brought it down. But again, this makes sense for the European that we are more, we are more responsible for ourselves. Now, uh, there was quite a discussion about not enough uh, engagement for Europe. For example, if you would have a soldier from the French army, Legion Etrangere, in Bosnia-Herzegovina being killed, being there in the service, uh, well, he goes back, he's not French citizen, he's Legion Etrangere, huh? uh, but he goes back uh, with covered by a French flag. He could be covered by the European flag. And then everybody said, what did they do to us? We must huh, react. So we, we can create this, and also through better education of the young people, everybody should go to Erasmus, at least a year, Erasmus Plus. So here, we are under pressure from the United States, Trump, and also from Putin. So we really have to get our act together. And I'm shocked that the Brits leave. It's very bad for us. But the Brits, in the last... Uh, 15 months, they have never objected to a further increase in common foreign and security policy. So I think it's not that bad, and we, 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 I think we can look uh, with more confidence in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Well, so what's on the menu for Europe? We heard so many different stories already. Uh, the last one, but certainly not the least, voice is Erhard Busek. Erhard Busek to present yeah. here uh, is, is not so difficult. Uh, he is, has, has had almost every function in Austrian uh, People's Party uh, from the early, no, from the mid 1960s onwards uh, until his time when he was deputy prime minister in, in from 91 to 95. Uh, he uh, lived through uh, the different phases of European history from the first experience, I think, was 1968, where he was directly involved also uh, as a young person with uh, people from then Czechoslovakia. Uh, he, uh, he was responsible for the city of Vienna as, as deputy mayor in the, in the 1990s, uh, 1980s, sorry, 1980s, uh, and minister for science and, and research, minister for education. There are so many titles I could, uh, I could give you, Erhard. Uh, why it's important is uh, because he always combined his intellectual interest with his political functions, which is a rare case, in, even in, in Austria, I, I, I would say. I would dare to say. Uh, and what he is now, he is now president of the Institute for Nubian Affairs and Central Europe. He is president uh, of the Gustav Mahler Youth Orchestra, various other presidencies, uh, and that means he is still alive and kicking. Erhard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for this nice presentation, uh, uh, Emil. Uh, I think uh, we have to look to the timetable and uh, try to make it as short as uh, possible. Uh, I think uh, the introduction beginning with Ruth Wodak uh, and uh, all of here, Concerning the personal connection on Europe uh, and the theme, uh, I may also repeat, I'm coming out of a family who, who the part of my mother and my father, they were all involved in the construction business. Uh, in the construction business in the old monarchy, uh, therefore it was quite usual to go around to work uh, in different, which is now different countries. Uh, it was one country. And so far, they had experience how it is in Bohemia, Moravia, Hungary, uh, in the northern Hungarian part, which is now Slovakia, uh, and for sure also Croatia, and so on and so on. We missed only Bosnia, I regret. Uh, so far, I think this experience was extremely important. It's not my experience. But we had family meetings. There was a kind of tradition. And then they were all coming up the engineers, uh, those who are in the construction business, who were working on different fields, uh, specialized, and so on and so on. And we are telling, as we were in and we built up, we had this experience, and, uh, and so on and so on. For sure, the one case which impressed me very much was my grandfather was responsible for the construction, not as an architect, but had to build it uh, at the Opera House in Odessa. 
Uh, my problem was, I think uh, he was always telling her at this time, boy, if you are grown up, you have to go to Odessa, it's really beautiful and so on. So. Not the slightest idea where, where is Odessa. I was very much looking <laughs> and so on. Uh, then it came out for me, it's in the Soviet Union. And uh, I may tell you, I've been there <laughs> in the meanwhile, and it is very impressive and so on and so on. What is his background? Not to speak about uh, geography, but I think they had different experiences out of uh, this uh, monarchy, uh, an experience which was connected in a very strange way. They were not speaking none of the languages of the monarchy, but only short sentences to advise the workers. So far, I heard always some phrases. Uh, they were in the languages of the family uh, here quite used including Jewish, they were not in the construction business, but they went to school together with 50% of uh, Jewish persons. And so far, I think I learned a lot uh, in this, and I'm extremely grateful because this is also a, a very important cultural experience for Austria, which is not too much known. So I grew up and had a feeling, looking to the Iron Curtain, there must be something on the other side. Huh? And that created a huge interest, I think, uh, uh, the interest grew up as uh, I had to serve uh, Hungarian students. I was only 15 years old in 1956, but we tried to do a lot for the Hungarian students coming to Austria. Uh, and uh, further on, I think I was also looking to the other side of the Iron Curtain. We were looking for groups which are existing here, looking to democracy and so on and so on. At this time, I was very much engaged in a Catholic youth organization, and so far I started here to support groups, uh, first of all uh, at Carta 77, uh, uh, Czechoslovakia, Czech Republic side, I have to say, uh, and then uh, it went to Solidarność, and, 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 and. Uh, I don't want to tell you all the stories, Matia Demokrata Forum, and so on. So the only one country where I was not able to go was Romania, uh, I didn't get a visa uh, because obviously I was pretty well known by Jose School or something like that, uh, really. That impressed me very much. And I think it connected for a lifetime uh, a very close feeling in this direction, getting the impression that's Europe. And I think what impressed me also very much by activity, we have to look to whole Europe. And here I'm criticizing the actual situation. We are still only looking by majority to the one part of Europe. I think we have not yet learned the other part of Europe. I am heavily criticizing all the Europeans and still my beloved European Union, even having members uh, now uh, at Central Europe, Eastern Europe I won't say, it is only Central Eastern Europe and so on and so on. They have not the slightest idea how these parts are looking uh, yes, okay, we have Tusk, don't like Tusk, but it is an LIP. Huh? And we had before my name colleague, Jerzy Busek, uh, he's coming from the same city yeah. where uh, the family of my father was coming. Uh, he's coming from Chichin, uh, Czeske Teshin, uh, which is Teshin for sure. Uh, so far, uh, there are some connections in this direction, but these countries being members since years in the European Union are not yet anchored within the whole system of thinking, of discussing, and so on and so on here. I think we missed a very important part of our own European Union. And so far we are missing the feeling for them. And all the difficulties concerning the Visegrad countries and, and, and is a lack of understanding because they have another history, because there was some time within the Soviet Union with all this education and so on and so on. And I'm very much campaigning still in Austria and elsewhere where I can go, go that we have to have more understanding for the situation. It's not so easy always to raise a finger what this horrible Viktor Orban has done and what the Kaczynski has done and so We have to look to the reasons. There are some reasons. There are things which are wrong without any doubt. But the mistakes are also done uh, in the Western part. Are you sure that whole Italy has fulfilled all the conditions for the European Union? I have my doubts. Uh, if I'm going to Apulia, I think it's not looking like a, a real European situations and so on and so on. I don't want to blame the Italians alone, it's all together. Uh, it was uh, 
spoken about the financial regulation, budgetary, th th budgetary things, uh, also now concerning Italy. May I say, uh, I think the financial regulations were offended, first of all, by the Germans. They were the first not following. Then the French, and, and, and. I think there's a long list nobody's speaking about. No? Now, for the first time, we are coming up, up in Italy. I think Italy did it for a long time, and there was no punishment, and so on and so on. Uh, this we have to know. I think we are not consequent of the European affairs uh, really here. I want to speak about the positive side that I'm joining the, uh, the point that the discussion, by all my respect to all the participants and their experience, was mainly too negative. Uh, I think uh, I got the impression, looking to Austrian literature, uh, I think it was Karl Kraus saying Austria is a test station for doomsday. Yeah. Uh, here I got the impression the European Union is a test station for doomsday. May I say, we Austrians are for a very long time test station for doomsday, but we are still existing. <laughs> and so I'm really convinced uh, that also the European Union will exist because we have no alternative. That has to be said quite straight. I think we are now 7% of the global population. We will shrink to 4% in the next 20 years at minimum. It might be even quicker. We are uh, around 22% of the economic production. Okay, we will shrink because India is coming up, China is coming up, and, and, and. And we are consuming 50% of the welfare side uh, of the European Union, being a rich part of the world, really with differences within the European Union, but uh, these responsibilities are also existing. What is the consequence? A lot of people want to come to Europe because we are looking better than others. Uh, we are not making the consequences out of it to improve there. We are building up fences, walls, and so on and so on. Having been aware that it is not a solution, the Chinese wall is existing for a very long time. It was not helpful. Uh, Therefore, I think we are not learning the lessons of history. That's a very important uh, comment to historians. I think uh, they are all not learning out of history. It has to be said bluntly. It's easier to discuss, to answer your question, it's easier to discuss history because everybody knows later on what was wrong uh, there. And if we would not have made the mistake then and, and so on and so on. I think we shall discuss about the possible mistakes we can do in the future. I think there's not enough discussion about there. That's the real duty of the history uh, which we shall use. So far, I want to continue. We learned a lot. It was already mentioned in, in several comments. May I say we have overcome a lot of things. We did enlargement even. Not perfect for sure, but it has happened and it has stabilized. That's a real reason because we had no further conflicts, maybe possibilities of wars and so on and so on, which is for sure not for guarantee that it might not happen. Even, uh, I want to shock you, I think we are in a preparation way of the Third World War without any doubt, uh, because we have a lot of conflicts existing, we are not really able to manage it, uh, and we have no instruments. I think we have the United Nations, but what was it worthwhile for the Ukrainian conflict? Nothing. Huh? I think there's only one organization contributing a little bit for improvement. It was the OSCE. Uh, they were the only one, at minimum, but it did something. And the rest, I think there was really nothing, it has to be said. And I think uh, if the criticism of this uh, famous book title uh, of Clark is, uh, I think we are in the same situation, without any doubt. I allow me to make some comparisons. If I'm looking to my beloved old monarchy, I think they had some slogans. Viribus unitis. Indivisibilita inseparabilita. Uh, and so on and so on. I think the same slogans I'm hearing if it is said about the European Union, huh? for sure. But is it the reality? I think this we can learn out of it because by all indivisibility and viribusonitis and so on and so on, it has happened. And obviously we are not really learning out of this. We had a real chance, uh, maybe even by the last big enlargement, because we had a uh, sympathy feeling for our neighbors. Here I am very critical on my own uh, beloved uh, home country. I think the sympathies are going down and we are criticizing and we are more and more in distance. 
the Austrian government at sometimes sessions uh, with the Hungarian government. Not anymore possible. I think we are really on distance, and we are also raising the fingers. We are making the same mistakes, maybe, and uh, have a, a certain way uh, look, uh, looking uh, at this. So far, I am uh, advised to be shorter. Uh, we have to look, I think, to the future. And we have to define the common problems uh, of Europe. That's our job, which we have to do uh, in common in, uh, in the future, which is not really happening. By all my deep respect to a meeting of historians, which we are doing, uh, but I think we are not looking even all the possibilities. Uh, may I say, in deep respect, Emil, uh, to what is happening here with this event, I was in the uh, Czech Republic on a similar event. They were starting the study from 1848 on. I think we were only saying 100 years. <laughs> so far, again, my beloved country has a difficult. What is the monarchy worthwhile for Austria? I think my beloved former state president Fischer was starting the opening speech of this 100 years celebration with on the 12th of November, we opened the, the Republic of Austria. Yeah? Uh, on uh, the 30th or 40th of March, Hitler was standing on the balcony here. The, but there was something before. I'm not a monarchist, but we are living out of this. We are selling it, I think, by tourism in sometimes a, a very horrible way. Yeah. It's not spoken about, but the contribution of the monarchy to this country is really important. That's not the merit of the Habsburgs. It's the merit of the Austrians, of those who are living here, and so on, and so on. Uh, it was mentioned that I'm uh, a little bit on the way of culture. I think what was by culture managed for Europe was extremely important. If we are looking to Gustav Mahler, he was not born in Austria. He was born uh, close to Yilava. Uh, if we are looking to the literature, they are elsewhere born, but not in Austria, uh, and so on and so on. But we are extremely proud. We are a culture nation. We are a nation of culture. I have my doubts. <laughs> it is a common possession of the Europeans, and that's our contribution, which we have to do, really. I think there's only one field in Europe which is in common. That's the one field where there is no responsibility of the European Union. That's culture. I think the commissioner for culture in, in the European Union is a poor man. He has a, a minimum budget, no responsibility, no possibilities, but the culture is working, for sure. And I think we have to focus more on this subject uh, to get more feeling. To get more empathy in the way of culture, that's one of the preconditions. Uh, and uh, that, that's a moment, otherwise my friend Emil will be angry with me. I'm closing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Erhard. I'm never angry with you. Sometimes I have different opinions, but that's okay. Let's have uh, a, a last round of, of questions. I know it's already uh, six o'clock, but I... Yeah, hopefully the buffet is working. The buffet is waiting, <laughs> waiting even. But uh, we, let's have a last round if there are questions here in the auditorium. Yes. Thank you very much. Just a second. Just a second. The mic is coming. Thank you very much. Do you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for nice uh, remarks. I have a question to. My name is Arsen Arakilian from Armenian Embassy and uh, graduate of from Vienna. What? Uh, yes, uh, Arsen Arakilian from Armenian Embassy, and I'm a graduate of the Diplomatic Academy, uh, class 2003. And I have a question to Ambassador uh, Bishevich uh, regarding the uh, points that you raised uh, uh, on uh, lack of lack of um, order, uh, lack of, uh, I mean, the, the global disorder rules the world, and uh, how you uh, excellently defined the multipolar, uh, multi-identical, something like that. I'm sorry, I, I cannot recall the uh, right definition. Nevertheless, do you think that the deals that rule the world right now are also common, common for all international organizations? 
because as far as I know, I mean, the international study also uh, studied that, that uh, all international organizations, they are based on, on, on deals, on deals in between nations, on deals in between powers, regardless they are uh, global or regional or whatever, and the lack of these deals lead to a complete disorder that we can uh, observe uh, nowadays. Thank you very much. On this side, yes, please. No, I will, I will collect three questions and then, please, because it's late. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I wanted to say to Mrs. Uh, Bodak, whose uh, presentation I much appreciated, but uh, to me, language is the key to personal and professional success in, in a new environment. And, and uh, of course, lack of it is not to be tossed in the face of, of people who want to come. But as an example, in, in Southern California in the 60s and 70s, uh, they decided to, to offer uh, uh, teaching in Spanish to, to people who came up uh, as refugees. And that was abandoned after a number of years because it didn't work. Uh, uh, they decided it's, uh, let's bring them into uh, a, a common language. And, and so, so much to that. To Mr. Wojnak, I wanted to say uh, on the subject of flexibility in, in the application of EU rules, uh, the banks, uh, European banks, were rescued uh, uh, some years ago. Uh, even the rescue of Greece was a bank rescue uh, at the expense of taxpayers. And, and in the end, the taxpayers sort of started going on the barricades. And then it was decided that from now on, we'll, we're going to let depositors and shareholders of banks take the pain. And along came uh, Monte di Paschi di Siena, uh, the first major case, and the rules were banned straight away. And there was a, a, an event at the National Bank where Mr. Moscovici uh, was present, and I had the opportunity to, to, to refer to that thing. And he just shrugged his shoulders and said, well, rules are there to be applied flexibly. I mean, that's not how you can work, especially not in, on financial matters. Mm. There's one more question. Yeah. Hello. Thank you, Director Briggs. Thank you, Professor Roth, for organizing this wonderful uh, panel of uh, invitees. Uh, I come from the Balkans and returning to the main topic of today's, uh, what, what, why history matters. If there is a lesson for the Europeans that has drawn, because what they have learned and drawn some similar points from the past, uh, are they going to be interested in integrating the Western Balkans finally? Thank you. Greece has no interest up to 2023. From then on, they will have to pay, and I can assure you they will pay. It may take 50 years. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I would like to briefly say something about the language policy here, yeah, which you addressed. And um, it's never the question of either or. Yeah, so it's not, nobody, no linguist or no sociolinguist would say uh, it's not important to know the language. So uh, that's a, a sort of straw man argument. The question is how do you support language learning? And uh, in the different European and EU countries that's done in very different ways, uh, and, and that's been studied, I've written about it in, in many papers and books, so the question is what I find is you to measure or to gatekeep people from coming just by knowledge of language uh, instead of you know, many other possibilities and then in supporting language learning in the best possible way. 
Uh, and I've been, I lived uh, in Sweden for two years as a guest professor, once in, in the close to Stockholm and last year as Willy Brandt professor in Malmö. And I've been able to watch how in Sweden this is implemented. And it's extraordinary. Yeah? If you compare that with Austria, um, well, it's, it's much, much better. Uh, in, and the people really go into pressure, sort of very good courses, five hours a day. It doesn't cost anything. They don't have to do tests. So they can go as long as they need to. And they really speak Swedish after a very short time. Yeah? So it's a question of how do you motivate people? How do you help them? How do you support them? Uh, what you do for small children, which is different than from adults, and so forth and so on. All these things are well known, well researched, but not applied by the Austrian government, if I may say so. That's very good. We always end at the very present day situation. That I like that. Uh, very shortly, briefly. if I may, very briefly. The problem of the, of the international organization, as much as I see it at the moment, or over the last years, is not that they lack rules and principles. The problem is the, their influence. The problem is uh, their capacity to be respected. The capacity to manage certain areas of the international relations. Today, if you simply Google, Today we have 40, 54 open conflicts and wars across the globe. Where are these international organizations? Mm -hmm. Simply as that. Thank you. The final word goes to our co-organizer, the president of our co-organizers, Erhard Busek. Beg your pardon, there is no final word <laughs> on the problems we were touching, only two comments. Uh, the first comment is there's always spoken about uh, new national neo nationalism. I think that's a total nonsense. It's the old egoism which is existing. <laughs> I think, uh, as it will always say, uh, there's a nice saying uh, which you know. Uh, it's better in the Viennese language, but uh, I try to translate this. Um, everybody's looking to him or herself. Only me, I'm looking on myself. Huh? Uh, this is now uh, the politics which is really happening. We are all looking on ourselves and we are forgetting that what we are doing for us and what we are not doing for us has an impact on others. That's a real consequence. That's the nonsense of this neo-nationalism and that's the next uh, uh, comment which I want to do and it was discussed concerning the role of the member states. Uh, I'm not discussing are the members, are the, is a nation state finished, yes or no. I think what we have to discuss on which level the problems should be solved. And for sure you cannot solve the problems of the climate catastrophe uh, on the level of the nation state. Forget it. Uh, here it's understood because obviously everybody knows that climate is not looking to, to borders uh, and so on and so on. And so far we are developing step by step some activities uh, too slow. And I think we have to do research on which level shall we do it. It might be the region, it can be still the nation state, it has to be done on the continental level and we need a lot of instruments on the global level. Uh, that's a real problem, I think, for the Europeans. They have to look for their role in the global context. What is our contribution? And what are we expecting for the other? We are far off of this. And the other problem is a, quite a problem where we are looking to, to the human being. I think what we are missing is empathy. Uh, we have not enough empathy. We, had, we have not enough empathy concerning the different situations. So we have a lack of understanding of the situations. I think we are easily judging the others and saying how horrible Kaczynski, Orban, or whoever is, and Trump, <laughs> and so on and so on. But we have to look to the situations here of the people really touched, and this we are really missing. Without any empathy, I think it's not really working. Uh, many thanks uh, to all who uh, did the job here uh, as uh, panelists and, and so on and so on. On behalf of the Institute for the Daniel Bridge and Center of Europe, I want to say many thanks. I'm happy that this event has happened 
and I've already mentioned before, this 100-year view, a kind of a jubilee, is it a jubilee? No, I think it's a horrible description. I think it's quite too short. I think we are, have a heritage out of the past of different reasons uh, and so on and so on and we have to mention it and we have to be happy. And out of this I think we need a kind of optimism that we are able to manage it. Uh, I think the let's target dementia, the last days of the human uh, mankind uh, will not happen quite soon. But we have to do a lot that it is not happening. All the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.